Welcome back, everybody. Oh, this episode. Oh, this episode, please. Okay, just pause for a second here. Make sure that you've got some paper, some pens, your iPad, your laptop, whatever it is. I, and for those of you who are driving or jogging right now, you're going to want to save this episode and go back because there's going to be notes that you need to take. As a communicator, learning about diversity, equity, and inclusion, what it is, what it isn't, it is my honor to bring Jennifer Brown in on Communicate Like You Give a Damn here in the podcast. I'm going to let her introduce herself, and we're just not going to waste any time, Jennifer. We're just going to go straight in. <laughs> okay. Straight in. Hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer. My pronouns are she, her, and Kim. Uh, it's such an honor to be joining you today. And if, if we are not communicators, we are nothing. Um, and I've oh. always been... Always oh, been. <laughs> oh, we're starting off like that. I am so happy about this. Say, say that again for the people in the back. If we are not communicators, we are nothing. We are nothing. <laughs> we will never get anywhere. We will, uh, it's some of the hardest work to do well, and it requires creativity and humility and flexibility and all the things that we can talk about today. But I, I mean, honestly, if you said to me, what is my biggest job? Um, you might say it's as a DEI professional, but it's really a communicator. Mm. It really is at the end of the day. That is it. Okay. I love it. I love it. I love it. You got to tell a little bit more about your background as far okay. as like, you know, the books that you've authored, the, the firm that you've built. And then I want to get into kind of what the genesis was of how you started Jennifer Brown Consulting. Totally. Yeah. So um, I'll maybe just roll that all in together. Um okay. So uh, I'll start. I was an opera singer in my 20s and uh, moved to New York to study and unfortunately injured my voice and, and had to get a couple of surgeries and had to really leave the field. And I thought it was like the end of my life, you know, when you're young mm -hmm. and have mm -hmm. stars in your eyes and I think that's the only way that you can make a contribution and be heard back to our point about communicators. Yeah, I'm starting but, um, to see it was, a theme it, already. Exactly. There's a theme going. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Um, but it wasn't the only way. And what was cool is the universe often redirects us, right? If we're not really using our voice in the way that we're meant to, literally and figuratively, I, looking back, I think that's what happened. I was redirected. And what I stumbled on was the world of, you know, it's under the HR umbrella, but really it's facilitation and leadership and organizational change. And I stumbled on that because a lot of facilitators, of course, used to be performers and still are. And um, it is a version of performance, but it's around a diff obviously a different topic. And I found it really fascinating to think about why do people change? What is the organizational structure and system? How do these companies get things done? Um, how do people use their voice in a system to change that system, to influence that system? And, um, and you know, what does it mean to be a leader? And I just, be I just became a student of that. And, and I did little did I know that I, I hung my shingle out and, um, 20 years ago. And, and, mm -hmm. but little did I know that we would, we would eventually kind of move into this DEI field. It was D and I back then. And then scarcely even the I, it was really just, you know, I'm talking 20, 25 years ago, we were really just having the diversity conversation. Um, and I moved into that because I'm a member of the LGBTQ plus community. And I'd been really active in a lot of advocacy work, but it was pro bono. It was through my friends who happened to be the only out LGBT. Mm -hmm. There was no Q plus then yeah. either. <laughs> like our yeah. language has changed. But back then we were, you know, there was, there were really tight circle of us that were trying to change companies for the better. And many of my friends that, that helped do free panels and were hosted by the different companies. We were talking yeah. about domestic partner benefits and you know, how do we change benefits and language and the non-discrimination policies and statements of the companies? And it was really, really, I, I really look back fondly on those days because I really learned how important our voices are in changing these massive institutions and how important showing up authentically is and how risky and that is and how much courage it takes to really push your institution, particularly when that institution is the one that's giving you a paycheck every two weeks. Right. Um, you know, and yes. leveraging though your identity to better the institution. And so really the birth of my commitment to DEI started back then. And then I realized that with my background in human capital and leadership and leadership effectiveness and team effectiveness, I could kind of bring in this DEI piece 
really a very dedicated DEI shop. And I started to build my team with consultants and began to write books about seven years ago. So I have four books now on four. inclusive leadership. Um, and I have a team of people who are amazing at what they do. And we now come into companies and deliver strategy and training. And I keynote and speak a lot. And so I am performing. I like to say I was meant to use my voice, just not as a singer. Uh, <laughs> and really to use the voice for what hasn't been voiced and who hasn't have, had a voice. Because mm -hmm. that's something that I really, I really relate to. Um, deeply for all the reasons that I just described. So it's really very fulfilling work. It's become more challenging lately, but it, I have to say it's been challenging all along. <laughs> so yeah. the only time yeah. it wasn't it even was challenging in 2020 and 2021, which we can certainly talk about just in a very different way, Yes, but it's always been challenging and, um, and, but very much um, deeply mission driven for me and everybody I know that does it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can think of, back when marriage equality was debated, let's be honest, it was debated. And yeah. so I would be, as, as a gay woman, I would be, you know, doing DEI communications in house at PayPal, for example, and I would be going to work and I would have power and privilege in that situation. Then I would go and do some speaking and be on a panel around gay marriage. And then all of that power and privilege was gone because mm -hmm. I was that, I was the gay person with the agenda, but it took the heterosexual person to, be the voice in that room and say, no, mm -hmm. we're not going to, we're not, we're, we're not going to stand for this. You know, they, they deserve these basic rights, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And which was very motivational for me, especially, especially even before 2020, but certainly through 2020 in this sense of shifting from allyship to advocacy. And I know you have kind of a leadership spectrum that you can speak mm -hmm. to and talking about what that allyship spectrum looks like and what mm -hmm. those steps are that are involved. You have a great model based on that. But that's when that was the shift for me to actually feel and experience not having, not being paid attention to, you know, mm -hmm. not having that, that power in a room uh, to be heard. Now I was taught on how to be a woman in the world <laughs> or in the United States growing up, but also being a gay woman when my rights were at stake you know, it, it became a real lesson for me on how much more I have to speak up and use my voice to your point. So mm -hmm. since you've started your shop over the last 20 years, you've probably seen some peaks and valleys. You've probably seen some waves of, you said it was D and I and barely hanging on an I, <laughs> the inclusion <laughs> in the beginning there. And so here there's, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Some people add the A for accessibility or access mm -hmm. or, um, uh, you know, accountability. Some people use A for that. And then you add the J in there and we can be Jedis, you know, with justice. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of acronyms to your point, like LGBTQ plus, like the acronym continues to grow. Mm -hmm. and, and friends who are listening, the reason is because it's trying to demonstrate that heterosexuality is just one of Many, many, many options of gender expression and sexual orientation. That's why the acronym keeps growing, because we're trying to demonstrate <laughs> that there's so many different ways to show up in the world. <laughs> right? That's, it seems so harmless and actually really good and beneficial. And yet, I think we get criticized for adding complexity. And it's like, no, it's actually not complexity. Like naming something is so important. I mean, imagine, your name is the most precious thing you can hear as a human you know, and imagine, you know, not having a word for how you identify. And so when you try to explain this to people, they're like, where does it end? And it's a slippery <laughs> slope and we're recognizing people too much and we're, we're allowing too much freedom for expression. And I'm like, I, are we really having this conversation? Right <laughs> Can you, do you hear yourself? Do I need to play this? Really? Back? Right? <laughs> too much freedom? Really? Really? <laughs> So tell uh, us about these peaks and valleys and what have you seen and, and how would you describe where we are now and where we need to go, especially I'm thinking of next year, like uh, we're recording this in the fall of 2023. This is a year ahead of the presidential election in the U.S., for example. Yeah, that's the crystal ball question, isn't it? You know, um, we have this big thing looming yeah. <laughs> next year and we none of us knows where it's going and, and what it will mean. And some, there's a lot of debate about whether, depending on the outcome, whether or not it will juice up the 
the DEI conversation again, or whether it will hurt it or, you know, be the wind beneath its wings. It's we're in a bit of the doldrums now. And I, I mean, I would say it's worse than doldrums. I mean, we're, we're, we have active, active pushback, more, more, more well-funded, more strategic than mm -hmm. I think we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it's a, for every action, there's a reaction, mm -hmm. you know, that's is it Newton's law. Uh, it is real. And, you know, and with hindsight, we should have seen it coming. You know, we should have expected it's coming because we know that that's, that's the way the pendulum swings around. Um, so, but it, I guess it has never been so sort of clearly binary before because we've never had an incident like 2020 George Floyd, you know, coming on the heels of the beginning of the pandemic and just the state that we were in that year, there was an openness, there was a truth telling, there was a purging, there mm -hmm. was a sort of an explosion of, of these truths. And there were circumstances that allowed that to happen. And that was so rare and so special, so difficult, so amazing, so transformative. Um, and yet we sort of, some of us ran really fast ahead. You know, we thought this is our moment. You know, we need to pack everything in. We need to tell everybody everything. We need to tell everyone that they're, you know, racist <laughs> because we grew up in a so racist society. Um, and there were books and there were, there was so much that was good. And I think there was so much truth in what we talked about. And looking back as communicators, back to this, did we you know, did we bring everyone along? Did we kind of slow down to speed up? Did we meet people where they're at, which is one of my most critical um, theories that I operate in, which is, you know, meeting folks where they're at and, and giving them the pieces to progress, but, you know, calibrating with that, because if you don't, then you just overwhelm the system and you create a lot of resistance where you didn't really need to. But I don't think there was a readiness. We all know this, I think. There was not a readiness on the part of a lot of people for what 2020 and 2021 taught us. There just wasn't a readiness. There wasn't a resilience to it. There wasn't the ability to digest like meal after meal after meal of new information, self-reflection, feelings and emotions around, wow, this world is messed up. I didn't know. I, I haven't been impacted in this way. What do I do? I mean, the overwhelm for all of us, you know, was really intense. So it was just a very, very unique time. A very, you know, like I said, you know, a really important time. But I think looking back, all of our, the enthusiasm and the progress is now being challenged and we could have foreseen that. And I don't know what I would do differently, but I do think there's always lessons. There's always lessons. You know, we have to be humble to the fact that we don't have all the answers about how we created change, how we facilitated and shepherded change in that time. And now this feels really painful and really difficult to be in a place of having these things be challenged in such a well-funded and organized way. And it's really, um, it's, it's, it feels harder than it should feel. And I, I don't want to be here <laughs> mm -hmm. and I want to be where we thought we would be. Um, perhaps some of us where we thought we where, where we, where we expected ourselves to be. And yet, and yet what a, what a really important lesson uh, for balance and for um, meeting folks where they're at and having to go back to go forward and going slow to go fast and all those things that I also believe in. Um, so I find myself having like, you know, back to basics conversations with some folks and, but I'm really grateful actually that some things are being said and questioned because those things were silent before, but perhaps now they're coming out. Um, and, and we can't deal with anything and heal anything, explain anything, support anything if we don't know it exists and it's not being said. So part of this is really for change makers. This is a really important moment to kind of give some things, some, some breathing room and um, to go back, to go forward. But previous to 2020, there were other kind of ebbs and flows, right? DEI has always been attached to the economy and how companies are feeling and doing. So in my world, important. for last- Yeah, that's yeah. really, can, can you dive a little bit deeper in there? Because I think people don't necessarily connect those dots. Oh yeah, that's so important to know. It's 101, at least in my world. And, and if you ask anyone in talent and leadership and HR even, I think the more strategic work ebbs and flows with how confident and well-funded companies are feeling. 
right? And how, it, to me, it's like Maslow hierarchy. It's the food, shelter, water at the bottom. And then it's the self-actualization as you move up. And companies go through that same uh, that same process of kind of toggling between, are we just sort of paying basic attention to staying alive? Or do we feel that we're staying alive? We've got excess bandwidth, money, et cetera, to focus on, okay, now how do we do this better for the long-term thinking versus like the short-term firefighting that you're doing when you're in economic duress? So, you know, as the economy goes up and down, we get more or less funded for the work because this to me is, and, and look, I can argue, you know, you and I would argue this is food, shelter, water. This is, d yes. is essential. Yes. yes. I'm just speaking from their point of view that- mm -hmm. It is not viewed that way. So we float along. <laughs> we unfortunately have, you know, the, the 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 huge ebbs and flows that we've experienced based on that. And it, it makes it really hard to run a business in the space, speaking as a business owner, because it's just completely unpredictable. And um, you have to, your shop has to be nimble, flexible. You have to have a flexible workforce of 1099s and employees. And you constantly have to be like making really hard decisions and you have to be ahead of the curves. So you need to be mm -hmm. able to, look into the future and say, well, you know, what changes do I need to make now in order to ride through the storm that's coming and yet keep the work alive and keep the community alive and continue to keep myself, you know, healthy because too, it feels really bad to be sidelined like this. It feels, it, it is the furthest thing from validating to feel like you ebb and flow with the vicissitudes of the economy, you know, because what kind of message does that send? That this work Absolutely. isn't always important, that it's only important when I have extra, you know, to give to it. No, but so we have to cope with that. And I, that doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good. No. And, and to also know that there's a line item within the legal budget for anti-discrimination, for harassment, mm -hmm. for all kinds of employee relations issues that is consistently well-funded mm -hmm. and even a percentage of that going towards DEI. Right. would prevent a lot of that end behavior, That's true. right? That's true. You know, true. so it's like just I working mean, with. It's so true, Kim, what you say, like, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a small percentage of, of that to ensure that problems don't happen, but we're just not, companies are so short term and they're thinking, and it's almost like they're based on their behavior. They would rather fight fires than address the upstream cause, you know, they rather deal with the symptoms and the after effects, but by then the damage is done. By then you've lost the key people. By then you had the reputational nightmare, you know? And so I know the, 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 what are they, the, the, I'm not forgetting this. There's a phrase about like a pound, an ounce of prevention oh. <clears throat> and a world of hurt when you don't make that investment. And you and I know that, but, um, it's, it's a constant struggle to say, you know, make this investment in your people so that they know not only the baseline of what's okay and what's not okay, but what inclusive leadership really looks like in practice and make that investment so that, you know, you don't have the issues on the back end. but I don't know. It, it feels very cynical the way that most decisions are made to kind of CYA and check that box. And we're still in the land of what we call performative DEI, which is that surface, that superficial, that compliance driven. And I feel like we're back to 2019, 18, 17. A lot of us are talking about how this feels like a, a big rewind um, back to that kind of thinking. And like the question is being asked now, like what was really gained over the last couple of years when we find ourselves where we are now? And I, I, that's, that's a very depressing way to look at it, but it's what it feels like. And I'm sure it's not true. We established a new waterline. Mm -hmm. a new watermark, right? A new threshold in the last couple of years. And this may just be a giant pendulum swing, but when it comes back, I, I hope it comes back further because we've made all that progress um, in those years, you know, the last couple of years ago, but I don't know. It's, it's anyone's guess. And next year is going to have a lot to do with, with what, what that answer is. Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel, mm -hmm. I agree with everything that you said. And one of the key points of, of, what the summer of 2020 really reflected. It was basically a mirror of kind of the great white awakening, right? You know, mm -hmm. so there was this, you know, this is really a call to action for people who look like me mm -hmm. to, to learn what they have been not aware of for a long time and then turn that into behavior. <clears throat> but then we, we just kind of went home 
and we left all that space open mm -hmm. that is now funded, strategized, coordinated mm -hmm. to fill with rhetoric that is inaccurate, that is a you know copy and paste from playbooks that has been used over not only just decades, but centuries, generations, just copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. It's the same thing. It's a dehumanization of language, et cetera. But this was a reflection to say, <clears throat> this is going on. Who are we in this? The change has happened. We thought we were farther along. Wait, we're not as far along. Wait, I'm uncomfortable. I have an edge. Wait, wait, wait. And, <laughs> and then it's like, okay, as my, as my mentor says, progress is not linear. It's a psych, it's a spiral. And so, yes, we're going back, but as we turn around that corner, we want to take more of us with us. So you're right. Completely agree with you that, that all of this that is now filling that void that we left as we walked away and went home mm -hmm. is, is filled with what was already there. So right. also to kind of um, utilize a quote from my mentor based on what you just talked about, is that whatever needs to be healed will be revealed. So Ooh. that's what's happening. And, mm. and, and, and it's just a matter of us taking responsibility that we're having, each of us are having a different experience. So to some of us, it's shocking that other people don't get the point of DEI. But there are yeah. so many people who look like me who genuinely don't understand the benefits and the value of DEI. Mm -hmm. And how do we make room for that as part of the conversation? Now, let's talk about who you primarily work with, mm -hmm. that demographic, that are in leaders, leadership, boards, executives, the C-suites. So you're in there with them. You are mm -hmm. teaching them inclusive leadership. I'm sure you're getting questions, pushback, that there is an edge that is identified there. So many of us in corporate communications work and advise and want to coach and move our leaders forward when we're seeing our leaders lean back and kind of adopt a, a, a duck and cover strategy when it comes to <laughs> social issues and DEI related topics. So we're left to our performative communications, right? Yeah. You know, and, and I'm hearing from regulated industries, from super, you know, traditionally conservative industries, mm -hmm. from communicators who are like, I know we have to be doing something better. We have to get beyond the, like, there's a genuine desire from communicators. But help us understand the mindset of these leaders, where they're at, and what have you found is it going to take to help them kind of get out of the duck and cover strategy, get out of the inertia and actually lean in and take up that space again? Yeah, it's such a good question, Kim. Um, I really like my work with executive leadership teams, um, just getting in there and eat. remember first, each person in that team is different. So that's mm -hmm. one, the very baseline I would give a reminder. Of course, it stands to reason, but I think that we, we sort of globalize things yeah. and we, we really shouldn't because actually our strategy should differ person to person. So if you've got a leadership team of eight people, each one of them is at a different place and about different things. And so sometimes you'll see a gender split. Um, you will see, I often find myself noticing that the, the female leaders, cisgender female leaders in the room uh, will be further along and sort of aligned, already there. Mm -hmm. And then the pushback and the questions and the skepticism may be coming from you know, the cisgender male leaders, because I'm saying cisgender because honestly, there's a majority cisgender people and humans um, in the in that room. And that won't always be thus, but it is currently. <laughs> yeah. We're working to change right. that, right. Um, but it is. So, you know, I often notice that, but not always, not always at all, not always. And then you've got the really loud leaders who are the ones that are throwing up all the obstacles and asking you all the hard questions. And then the really silent ones mm -hmm. uh, who maybe made a mistake recently and don't want to say anything because they're now kind of in this watchful, fearful sidelines place, you know, so people's yeah. intent can be, and their heart can be in it, but they're afraid. Mm -hmm. Um, they can be, um, actively resistant. They can be cautiously supportive mm -hmm. and then they can be very overtly supportive. 
And you've got that whole plethora in every team. And um, so anyway, just really fascinating. And then, and then there's dynamics of ethnicity. So mm -hmm. it's majority white in most executive leadership teams in most companies today. Again, this will change and we're working hard to change that, but that is what, what we're met with. So there's a lot, like you say, of un not understanding the white experience, not understanding the privileges that come along with walking through this world in um, seemingly white identity. And I say seemingly because there's a lot of invisible diversity dimensions in terms of how we identify. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's a lot of, to me, my, the work feels in those rooms like it's a sort of massive challenge of group management and group dynamics, number one sort of noticing who's being heard, who's not being heard, who's afraid to speak up. And sometimes if you have one or two executives of color, sometimes they will be hanging back because they have said this a million times and they haven't been heard. And sometimes they will continue yeah. to say it and be very bold in the room and all, everything in between. Sometimes you'll have an out executive who's holding back or who is very verbal and, and vocal and proactive. So really um, noticing too how people's identities impact the way they show up yeah. in a conversation and how strong or not they feel comfortable being about their own lived experience. And it's really interesting too, speaking of communication, I'm in there as an external person and I reflect on the role I'm playing. You know, I'm the space holder. I'm the container builder. I'm the person that's noticing who sucks up all the oxygen in the room. And, yeah. and I'm also thinking about seniority is another factor who's the loudest voice and are they the most senior person and are they supportive or resistant? Cause sometimes actually the CEO is the most difficult person to manage in a room like this. Um, they have the authority and if they are skeptical and questioning, um, I'm grateful for that because actually that person is the most important person to get on board, like the most. Uh, but sometimes you'll spend a lot of time kind of navigating and managing their questions and their pushback. And, but you know that it's important you do that because they've got to get their questions answered. They have to come to a place, re agree or disagree, they need to come to a place where they are leading. And this is such an important point. This is not an agree or disagree conversation. When you are leading an institution and you stand up to lead, you, you, you sign up for that job, your job is actually is irrespective of your personal beliefs, actually. It is the values of the institution, and hopefully you've done values alignment and creation, and everybody's participated in that. And usually these days, one of those values is inclusiveness, called various things, but that is. So right. when you sign up to be a leader, you are, you're charged with leading this institution through change. And a lot of that change is demographic change of your talent, of your current and future employees, of your marketplace and your buyers and your customers and your clients. It is all changing. And I can tell you, it is changing away from white cisgender male identities. So if we can all agree on that baseline, that's where I sort of come back to in these rooms to say like, Okay, we can in this room we can have some conversations about beliefs and et cetera, you know, but at the end of the day, you need to make sure that this institution remains viable, it thrives, it is thinking ahead into the future, and it resonates, and you're able to come up with what is going to resonate with that changing world that you serve. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is to not have a homogeneous group of people at the table, creating products, innovating customer strategies, et cetera, you're going to miss a lot if you don't have A, the diversity at that table, B, the inclusion at that table, which means I'm heard, I'm asked for my perspective, I can weigh in on my lived experience. It will be heard and acted upon, not just heard, right? And so we need to follow the whole logic that in that way uh, so that it gets out of this, Jennifer, this is too political. And I'm like, how people identify in their lived experience is not political. And it is also not political to, to make the, you know, create the logical argument that I just did, um, which I think we all agree on, really, which is, is the furthest thing from politicizing something. It is really, you know, to me, the, sur the survival and the success of an institution in a really chaotic fast changing, unpredictable world, you have to sort of, you know, embed these truths that, you know, not whether you agree or disagree with them, they just are, which is how the world is changing. 
So for communicators, this is what we call the business case, what I just described to you. And um, returning to that is a very, it's a prudent practice because business leaders get it. And I also think we need to kind of, if they, they try to take you off in, into a rabbit hole around, you know, the politics of things, or there's another rabbit hole, by the way, of um, if we give people an inch around identity, they'll take a mile, kind of like how you and I have been talking about, Kim, like, yes. where does it end? And like, how many, how many incidences are we expected to address that are happening in the external world? Like, right. you know, they, they, in my book, they picked out this quote. Uh, the most recent example, I, executive team I was working with, and um, there's a, a, a Latina identified um, employee that came in on a Monday morning and said, somebody asked how their weekend was. And there, it was during 2020 and there was marches and so much pain and so much articulation of, of suffering. And she had been active in all of that over the weekend and there had been violence and all the things that were happening. She came in and she's like, my weekend was a racist hellscape. How was yours? And these white leaders kind of picked up on this. And we had this whole discussion about the word hellscape and this whole discussion about Monday and like what, what people are entitled to bring in to the workplace. And it was really so interesting uh, to just dig into that and say, you know, so what do we expect people to sort of hide and downplay and stuff into a corner and not talk about? And how do we expect, do we want people to bring their full selves to work? What does that mean? Where does the, where is the boundary? Um, if we do one thing for one community, then what do we do need to do for the other communities? And, you know, and, and, and those, that's a lot of like tug of war in these sessions because there's a lot of discussion about it. Like, does it matter? Is it important? Um, how do we do it? What do we do it for? What if we have disagreement? We have disagreement around the abortion question. I mean, most of my, my clients will say our workforce is split on this question. So then we say, okay, so how do we enable the inclusion of that and to be heard? But then as a company, what do you want your decision to be around benefits? Those two things can exist together and side by side. And how you navigate this is you can... It's not this one or it's not a binary yes, no, we agree, we don't, we say this, we don't say whatever. It's a lot of different things that enable people to be simultaneously heard and acknowledge the diversity of opinion. And yet at the same time, a, a, a choice on the part of the institution to go a certain way and provide certain things. And to your point, communicators need to parse this and communicate it in a very delicate way. And I feel for the communicator community because this is hard to thread this needle. I mean, that's just one example of many that there, it feels like you're kind of in a balancing act. And honestly, Kim, this is the new job of a communications professional. You know, you've got to know how to advise your leaders on how to hold the space for all of this. And at the same time, point your arrow and your compass towards a future and, and maintaining your commitments to be, being an employer of choice that is thinking about and planning for and supporting a rapidly diversifying workforce and environment. So I know I can't like wrap this up in a nice, neat bow, but if you can ask the right questions and you can kind of surface a lot of these things and then keep your eye on the ball about what the future holds, then I think you'll be able to help your leaders you know, make the right decision. And if they want to sit in the middle of all of this, fine. Middle is okay. For some companies, your company's in the middle. You know, you're in, you're figuring it out. And you're doing a little of this and a little of that. And you're, they're trial balloons and you're kind of trying to find your voice and, and you don't want to come out like gangbusters on, you know, 10 different issues tomorrow. And you want to take your cue, these affinity groups that you've just formed and they're just getting started. And that is fine. You need to meet the organization where they're at. You don't need and push a little, but, but I wouldn't say, I would never, ever say throw your leaders and your company into the deep end without having this sort of muscle built for the deep end. You don't want to drown in the deep end. You want the, you want the skill to tread water there and you need to assess where is the organization? Where are my leaders? What are we ready for? What are, what is not going to cause more resistance, but is going to enable 
the majority of folks to feel heard, to be on board, maybe not agree, but understand where we're going and understand that it's a leadership imperative. That was a long answer. (laughs) (laughs) There's so much good stuff in there. Some things that I want to highlight, you know, the decoupling of the politicization, I can't say that word. Politicization. Thank you. Thank you for that. You're on East Coast time. So, you know, <laughs> more coffee mouth is warmer. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, you know, that decoupling absolutely has to, has to happen because there, there's a created narrative that actually doesn't exist. So my being gay or my being a woman, you know, is not, you know, it has been, my identity has been politicized, but just like being a man, being white, you know, that, that is somehow exempt of being politicized. So it's just like this decoupling and being consistent about it, I think is, is, is really key. And also I love all the analogies around treading water and, you know, you just, it was a nice layup to the depth model that we talk about in the book, the conscious communicator. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Excellent book. Yeah. (laughs) Well, thank you for your testimonial in it, Jennifer. I really appreciate it. We're very, very grateful for your support of the book, for sure. And in that framework, it helps answer some of those questions. You said earlier in that response, leaders need to have their questions answered. Now, there's two parts to it, I'm sure, that you've run into as well. Is like some leaders will throw out things, but they don't want to know the answer. They don't want to go, you know, it's like it's more of just like, you know, saying something Mm -hmm. to say something, but they're not actually genuinely interested in, in learning. But then there are the people who the leaders who do want, you know, those questions, but they don't know where they can get those answers from in a way that they can receive them and know what to do with it. Because I want empathy for leaders, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't get to be where they are because they're incredible at DEI, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't part of their performance, you know, as they climbed the ladder and promoted, you know, it was like, you know, there was no 360 when they were at director level saying, how are you on your DEI skills? You know, (laughs) So you know, right. so here they are. And now they have to be good at it. Like yesterday. I mean, it's completely yeah, yeah. unrealistic. And yet they have this pressure from the boards, pressure from customers, mm. pressure from employees, say something, do something. So the depth mm. model helps with that middle, like you were talking about, like, you know, it gets you into the work in a meaningful transformational, that's not a word, transformational way. So right. that, that was all of your points were so key. And the other part of something that I want to highlight uh, what, uh, from what you just said is that communicators can be those advisors to help those leaders get those questions answered. They could set things up. They can engage in conversation themselves and not let comments like, we don't want to do too much too soon, mm-hmm. be a decision. As you know, like that's the end of the conversation. It needs to be the beginning of the conversation. So what is too much? What is too soon? What does that look like? But the decoupling, I think that's really important for people to hear and understand. And at the same time, understand that, you know, when you were talking about um, the agree, disagree, it's like Mm -hmm. my identity is not a negotiation. You know, that's not a pawn, right? It's not, that's not negotiable. Mm -hmm. And what, Mm -hmm. you know, and on the abortion topic that you were talking about earlier, it's, it's this crossing of the line that we need to keep each other in check. So you can believe one way, but if I believe another way, because I'm having a different experience than you, Hmm. you know, and so, and then you're having a different experience than me. So where you're coming from feels very real to you. And where I'm coming from is very real for me. And then the negotiation is not on my identity, but the negotiation Hmm. is how do we coexist as colleagues to allow ourselves to honor our experiences in a way that we can coexist and and thrive together in the same space. You know, that's the negotiation. That's what needs to be negotiated. That one, that's, that's the communication. The negotiation is not your experience trying to legislate my experience and my decision-making, you know, and vice versa. So it's a very rich uh, conversation. <laughs> and and, well and as, I, <laughs> as I point to it, language leads to behavior. That's why, you know, I have so much money on the communicators and really leading this work. Oh. Okay, friends, we're actually going to pause the conversation right here. I know it is so good. And it was really building up momentum. You probably hate me right now. But 
the conversation when we, we recorded was so good. We just kept going and going. So we're going to split it in the sake of your time and protecting your time. We're going to split this conversation into two different episodes. So keep a lookout and find the other half and the other part of this conversation with this guest. I know you're going to love it. So what popped out to you from the conversation? The more conscious communicators in the world, the better the world. So go to communicate like you give a damn podcast.com and set up a one-on-one strategy session. And until next time, let's keep taking care of each other.